Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. I am delighted to supply you with a long video, including the top 5 most watched videos that I have made with a total view count of over 1.2 million views. So hopefully this video may get over 10,000 views this week. Please watch as much of it as you can, like, comment and subscribe and click in the bell icon for notifications. Thank you for watching. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of Josephine Gray from Maryland. Josephine was born in 1946. Very little is known about her early life, but court documents would later make reference to her difficult childhood, the details of which are unknown. What we do know is that as a young adult, Josephine was known to be a flamboyant character who liked to drive flashy cars and wear eye-catching outfits. Despite her outgoing, gregarious nature, she was attracted to quiet, kind men and in 1967, at the age of 21, she married a man by the name of Norman Stribling. Josephine worked as a custodian for the Montgomery County Public Schools, a position which she had held throughout her adult life. Josephine and Norman had five children together, but their marriage was far from happy. At some point in the early 1970s, Josephine took an additional part-time job cleaning offices, and here she met a man by the name of William Gray. Mr. Gray went by his middle name, Robert. Robert was in his early 30s and married with six children when he met Josephine. Up until this point in his life, Robert had been a real family man, doting on his wife and children. However, this soon changed when he met Josephine. Robert's friends and family stated that it was like something inside of him had snapped and his entire demeanour and personality changed. Robert and Josephine had started an affair and Robert became increasingly distant towards those who knew him. He stopped visiting his friends or paying attention to his family. When the affair was discovered, those close to Robert felt that Josephine had some kind of hold over him. Robert's wife, Frances, would later comment that she believed that Josephine must have been adding something to Robert's food in order to make him do as she said. Frances believed that this theory was confirmed when Robert stopped eating any food prepared by Josephine and his former personality returned. Josephine had a collection of powders, roots and teas hidden in her bedroom and when Robert was once again in her company, his strange, distant persona would return. Meanwhile, Norman, who had realised that his wife was having an affair, had become increasingly fearful of Josephine. Rumours were rife that Josephine was dealing in witchcraft and voodoo. Norman told those close to him that he feared for his life and that he had seen his name in spells that Josephine had written. Norman's fears were justified when, one night, he woke up to find Josephine pointing a gun at him. His life was spared as the weapon misfired and he was able to escape. On the 4th of March 1974, Norman was not as fortunate. His body was found in his car on an isolated road in Gaithersburg, Maryland, a short distance from his home. He had been killed by a single shot to the right side of his head in what initially looked like a robbery. However, before long, two witnesses had independently approached the police to state that Josephine had offered them $5,000 in return for murdering Norman. Two weeks later, Josephine and Robert were arrested and charged with Norman's murder. It didn't take long before all charges against the pair were dropped. Key witnesses either refused to cooperate with the police or could no longer be found, and without the witnesses, the prosecution simply did not have a case. The authorities soon realised that a very unusual form of witness intimidation was being used. As irrational as it may seem to some people, family members and witnesses were terrified by the idea that Josephine had the ability to practice witchcraft and voodoo and as such refused to speak up against her. A member of Norman's family would later describe him as being under a magic spell that caused him to uncontrollably scratch his face to shreds. When Norman's life insurance policy paid out, Josephine received around $15,000. That's the equivalent of around $85,000 today. She used this money towards the purchase of a house with her new fiancé, Robert Gray. In November of 1975, a year and a half after Norman's murder, the pair married and soon after Josephine gave birth to their first and only child together. It was Josephine's sixth child and Robert's seventh. 
According to Robert's mother, her son's marriage was never a happy one, and this was compounded when, in the mid-1980s, Josephine's second cousin, Clarence Good, came to live with them. Clarence was a teenager at the time, and was having a hard time where he lived in Brooklyn, New York. Josephine promised her relatives that she would take good care of Clarence, and he moved to live with Josephine and Robert in Maryland. At some point in the late 1980s, it was reported that Josephine and Clarence began an affair. She remained married and living with Robert, while she had an affair with Clarence, who lived under the same roof. By the summer of 1990, the situation had become unlivable. At one point, Josephine chased Robert through their home with a gun. He had to jump from a second floor window to escape her, and ran to his parents' house, which was about a mile away. Robert finally decided that he'd had enough and would move out for good. Josephine continued her affair with Clarence and it is believed she simultaneously started an affair with one of her co-workers. Like Norman before him, Robert began telling those closest to him that he feared for his life. He said that Josephine had assaulted him on several occasions and when, in August 1990, she allegedly attacked him at his place of work with a baseball bat and knife, he brought criminal charges against her. A hearing regarding this assault was scheduled for the 5th of October, but a continuance was issued until November the 16th. Following the hearing on the 5th of October, Robert was driving when Josephine started following his car. She started flashing her headlights, indicating that she wanted him to pull over. Robert tried to ignore her, but she pulled alongside his car, and as she did so, Clarence pointed a gun directly at Robert. Panicked by this, Robert managed to put the car into reverse and escape. Again, this incident was reported to the police and Robert began changing the beneficiary on his life insurance policies to ensure that Josephine had nothing to gain from his death. Robert rented an apartment in Georgetown and invited his family over for a celebration. It seemed that Robert was back to his old self, with one of his children commenting that the spell was broken and that they finally had their dad back. Less than a week later on the 9th of November 1990, one week before Josephine and Clarence were due back in court, Robert was shot dead. He had finished work at Clopper Mill Elementary School where he was a building services manager at around 2.30pm. He returned home, and as he walked into his apartment, someone was waiting inside. They fired two shots hitting him in the neck and chest. His body was found by his father and a family friend who had become concerned for his welfare. The business card of a police detective who he had been asking for help was next to his body. It took six months of investigation before Josephine and Clarence were charged with Robert's murder. Josephine was also charged for a second time with Norman's murder. It was reported that two of Josephine and Norman's children, 26-year-old Brenda and 23-year-old Bernard, told investigators that they believed their mother was responsible for their father's murder and that she had also been planning the murder of their stepfather. Additionally, statements made by Josephine's brother, Donald Mills, and her daughter, Regina Gray, implicated Josephine in the murders. However, when the two defendants were released on bail, the prosecution's case began to fall apart. It immediately became clear that there was a marked difference in witness cooperation from when Josephine was being held to when she was out on bail. Both Donald Mills and Regina Gray recanted their incriminating statements. During the investigation into Robert's murder, Josephine was asked about her involvement in witchcraft and voodoo. She denied being involved in either, calling it absurd. I do not practice no voodoo and I do not practice no witchcraft. Just because I go and buy a lucky charm to play the lottery, or something to buy herbs and drink herb tea, or take olive oil and anoint myself. That's in the Bible. However, prosecutors believed otherwise and felt that the whole investigation was permeated with fear. On the 4th of September 1991, a judge ruled that they would allow evidence at trial of a phone conversation between Josephine and a voodoo doctor. This voodoo doctor, Rosie Sims, had gone to the police to tell them that Josephine had approached her about killing her husband. Soon after, prosecutors stated that Rosie Sims, who was on probation at the time, could no longer be located. 
On the 1st of October 1991, it was reported that prosecutors had dropped the charges against Josephine for Robert's murder, but the trial would still go ahead for Norman's murder 17 years earlier. The then Assistant State's Attorney, Thomas Tam, stated that the charges were dropped for strategic reasons, which included the preservation of the state's right to refile them at a later date. Seven weeks later, on the 19th of November 1991, the charges against Josephine for Norman's murder were also dropped due to a key witness in the case being missing and others refusing to testify. This was the second time that charges were dropped after a witness disappeared. Despite the changes he had made to some of his life insurance policies, Josephine still received over $50,000 after Robert's death. She used this money to pay off the balance owed on her home, which she had initially financed with her first husband's life insurance payout. With no outstanding charges against them, Josephine and Clarence carried on with their life together. However, Clarence had become increasingly isolated and miserable. Josephine would not allow him to have his own key to their home, a car or any money of his own. In 1996, Josephine threatened Clarence with a knife, after which he moved out of their home. He began to stay with relatives around the Baltimore area, wherever he could find a bed for the night. He started to gain a little independence when he began working for the armoured car service, Loomis, but made what would ultimately become a fatal error when he allowed the insurance policy, of which Josephine was the beneficiary, to lapse. With no premiums being paid, the policy would only remain in effect for a further 60 days. On the 21st of June 1996, Baltimore police found Clarence's body in the boot of his car. He had been shot with a 9mm handgun. Prior to his murder, Clarence had told his sister, Veronica, that he was going to visit Josephine. He had also spoken to people about how he felt as though his life was in danger and how scared he had become of Josephine. Following the discovery of Clarence's body, Josephine's house was searched and some 9mm bullets were found. There was a large stain on the garage floor which tested positive for blood and a commercial vacuum cleaner which also contained traces of blood. However, there was still not enough evidence to charge Josephine with Clarence's murder. Once again, Josephine received a life insurance payout. This time, it was around $100,000. It would seem that Josephine had got away with murder yet again. Frustrated by this, prosecutors decided upon a new strategy to bring Josephine to justice. She was now dating a man by the name of André Savoy, who had no idea what had happened to the three other men. Again in this relationship, Josephine controlled everything, with 48-year-old André often being seen by neighbours locked out of his own home, as Josephine did not allow him to have his own set of keys. When the police reached out to him, he agreed to help. On the 7th of November 2001, a federal grand jury indicted Josephine with eight counts of mail and wire fraud for collecting the money from the insurance policies. The indictment stated that she had intentionally caused the deaths of her former partners and then concealed her roles in the deaths in order to claim on the victim's life insurance policies. These policies would be covered by Maryland's so-called Slayer's Rule, which prevents any person who intentionally kills the insured to receive the benefits of the policy. These charges did not require Josephine to be found guilty of murder to gain a conviction. The prosecutors just had to prove that she had a role in each death. Due to her history of threatening witnesses, she was held without bail at Prince George's County Detention Center whilst awaiting trial. During this time, she called Andre and warned him to take the fifth and remain silent rather than testifying against her. The trial began in July 2002 and Josephine pleaded not guilty to all charges. The prosecution claimed that she was a master manipulator who used each lover to kill their predecessor. She was accused of ruling her husbands and others close to her with violence and intimidation. An incantation was caught on tape and voodoo ritual materials, including a voodoo doll made with real hair, were discovered in Josephine's home. However, the defence claimed that this mother of six and grandmother of eleven was a three-time surviving victim who had been subject to relentless gossip, rumour and innuendo. 
They stated that she had received life insurance payouts, which she was perfectly entitled to, in order to make a better life for her children and grandchildren. They went on to claim that many of the prosecution's witnesses had been involved in insurance disputes with Josephine over the years, and much of the prosecution's case was based on statements heard over 20 years earlier. After a three-week trial, the jury found Josephine guilty of all counts. She was subsequently given the maximum sentence for her crimes, 40 years in prison. She showed no emotion as the sentence was read out, but made a statement through her public defender, maintaining her innocence, stating that she gives her faith in God as a higher power who knows she has committed no offence or done anything wrong. In 2006, she tried to appeal her sentence based on the Supreme Court's 2005 decision that the use of mandatory sentences was unconstitutional. However, the original sentence was reaffirmed. She is currently being held at FMC Carswell, a federal prison in Fort Worth, Texas, and she has an earliest release date of 26th of February 2037, when she will be 91 years old. That concludes today's case. I would like to thank Renee Dennis for suggesting this story. She left a comment on the Jill Coit case. With Renee, if a case has been on television, Renee will always comment to say which show it has been on. And on this case, she tells me this was profiled on Deadly Women. Please add any comments down below and click like and subscribe. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Josephine Gray is sometimes referred to as the Voodoo Queen. Goodbye. For today's true crime story, we shall be looking at the story of Auburn Calloway. Auburn was born in Washington DC on the 13th of December 1951. He was one of four children born to Miriam and Earl Calloway. Auburn was an extremely intelligent and studious child who always achieved excellent grades in school. He enjoyed karate, later becoming a black belt, but other than that spent the majority of his time studying rather than socialising. Auburn attended Stanford University and after graduation went on to join the US Navy. In the mid-1980s, when Auburn was in his mid-30s, his mother Miriam died. She had suffered from schizophrenia and paranoia and had been hospitalised for many years. Following her death, Auburn became estranged from his father and siblings, and despite an attempt at reconciliation in the 1990s, their relationship was never retrieved. At around the same time as his mother's death, Auburn got married and went on to have two children, a son and a daughter. By the late 1980s, Auburn had secured a job as a flight engineer at FedEx. He also volunteered for charities and worked in the local community. At that time, a flight engineer would earn around $80,000 per year and Auburn was on track to be promoted to co-pilot and then captain. That would see his annual salary increase to $150,000 and beyond. To anyone looking in, he was a successful and accomplished man. Sadly, in 1990, his marriage ended. The split was handled amicably and he tried to maintain a good relationship with his children and continued to support both them and his ex-wife. As he continued his role as a flight engineer, with the hope of progressing up the career ladder, it was discovered by FedEx that he had lied on his resume when he was hired six years earlier. It came to light that he had greatly exaggerated his flying experience with the US Navy, which, had it been known at the time, would have meant that he would never have been employed by FedEx. As a result of this, a disciplinary hearing was set for the 8th of April 1994. Despite the fact that Auburn believed he was the target of a witch hunt, he knew that in all likelihood he would be fired and his flying career would be over. Even in the very unlikely event that he could secure a job with another airline, he would need to start over. With the airline industry in a massive financial slump, the chance of a pilot who had been fired from their previous job obtaining new employment was as good as zero. So Auburn came up with a plan. On 6th of April 1994, Two days before the date of the hearing, Auburn decided to get his financial affairs in order. He updated his will, closed his bank accounts and sent his money to his ex-wife and two children who now lived in California. As a FedEx employee, his ex-wife would get a $2.5 million life insurance payout if he was to die while still employed. Auburn then went to work. He was scheduled on a round-trip flight from Memphis to San Jose and back carrying computer equipment. 
This equipment would end up at the massive FedEx sorting hub at Memphis Airport. The intricately designed cargo plane schedule meant that the large majority of planes would run on time to ensure that FedEx were about to maintain their well-publicized next day delivery promises. However, on this particular day, the return flight was kept in a holding pattern for around 10 minutes. This led to Auburn and his two colleagues completing over eight hours of flying time in that particular day. The Federal Aviation Administration had strict rules in place which meant that any crew who flew over 8 hours in one day would have to rest for at least 16 hours before flying again. This meant that Auburn and his two colleagues would be ineligible to operate the same return trip to San Jose on the following day. Auburn was extremely reluctant to note the correct times, stating that if the times were adjusted by just a minute or two, they would be allowed to fly as scheduled. However, the captain, aware of how strict these regulations were, insisted on all times being recorded accurately. Auburn was desperate to be on the same flight the following day and was determined to find a way to make it happen. April 7th, 1994 was a beautiful clear day. Three other men were contacted to see if they could work because of Auburn and his crew needing to take the mandatory rest period. Captain David Sanders was a 49-year-old ex-Navy pilot with over 20 years service at FedEx. First Officer Jim Tucker was a 42-year-old who had also been flying with FedEx for many years and Andrew Peterson was a 39-year-old experienced flight engineer. They all arrived at work at Memphis International Airport to complete the return flight to San Jose that day. Andrew, the flight engineer, was the first to board the plane. When he arrived, he found that Auburn was already on board. As a perk of their employment, FedEx allowed employees to get a ride on cargo planes free of charge, so this wasn't an unusual situation. Auburn introduced himself to Andrew and told them that he was catching a lift to San Jose where he was going for a short visit. The only luggage he had with him was his guitar case. Andrew started to complete his pre-flight checks. He noticed that the cockpit voice recorder, CVR, was switched off. He reset this and carried on with his checks. Slightly later, he noticed that the CVR was off again, without a cockpit voice recorder, which would be used in the event of an accident to hear everything that had been said. The flight would need to be cancelled. Andrew decided to reset it once more, and if it faulted again, he would call maintenance and the flight would be stopped. Soon after, Captain David Sanders and First Officer Jim Tucker arrived. Pre-flight checks were finalised, the cockpit voice recorder was now working and the flight was cleared for takeoff. Less than 30 minutes after takeoff, with the plane approaching an altitude of 19,000 feet, Auburn opened his guitar case in his position of privacy outside of the cockpit. Prior to the events of 9-11, employees did not usually need to have their luggage screened before boarding an aircraft. Knowing this to be the case, Auburn had packed several hammers, a spear gun and a knife in his guitar case. Auburn wanted his family to receive the life insurance payout before his employment was terminated, but knew that if he took his own life, that would not be the case. Auburn had formulated a devastating plan. He decided that he would attack the crew with hammers, take control of the plane and crash it into the Memphis headquarters of FedEx. Any injuries that the crew sustained would be indistinguishable from those received in the plane crash and FedEx would be destroyed by what would universally be perceived as a tragic accident. Had the original crew been able to fly that day, Auburn would have been with only two other crew members sat directly behind them in the flight engineer's seat. As it was, there were three other men on board the plane and Auburn was in a seat outside of the cockpit. Whilst this made it more difficult for him, with the hearing scheduled for the following day, Auburn knew this was his only opportunity to execute his plan. While the plane was still ascending, Auburn walked into the cockpit and struck Andrew in the head with the hammer multiple times. As Jim turned to see what was going on, Auburn struck him on the left side of his head with the hammer. Auburn then turned to David and landed a blow to David's head, which knocked him unconscious. Amazingly, despite sustaining significant blows to their heads, both Jim and Andrew were still alive. Trying to gain complete control of the situation, Auburn rushed from the cockpit to retrieve his spear gun. As Auburn returned, Andrew, despite having a fractured skull and suffering from tunnel vision and audio disturbances, managed to grab the tip of the spear gun and tried to wrestle it away from Auburn. As the fight continued, Jim got an idea. He put the aircraft into a steep climb, which threw Andrew, David and Auburn out of the cockpit. Andrew and David continued to fight with Auburn. David was still disorientated from being knocked unconscious. In addition to his fractured skull, Andrew's temporal artery had been severed and he was losing a lot of blood. It wasn't long before the uninjured Auburn started to overpower the two men. 
Jim, who was an ex-Navy flight instructor, knew that he couldn't risk Auburn gaining control over him, his colleagues, and ultimately the airplane. During the initial assault, the hammer blow had fractured Jim's skull and embedded pieces of skull fragment into his brain. Still flying the plane, he was starting to lose feeling and control over the right side of his body. Despite this, he started to complete some complex aerobatic maneuvers. This was to prevent Auburn gaining his balance and then taking control of the aircraft. Jim violently rolled the plane from left to right before turning the plane almost upside down and eventually placing the aircraft into a deep dive. The aircraft, a DC-10, had never been flown faster. The plane was completing a barrel roll at nearly 400 miles per hour, something way beyond the aircraft's tested ability. With only one function in hand and the aircraft travelling at 100 miles per hour over its maximum safe speed, amazingly, Jim managed to retrieve the aircraft from its dive and levelled off at approximately 5,000 feet. He contacted the Memphis Centre and informed them of the situation. Whilst plane hijacks were more common in the 1990s, a hijacked cargo plane was virtually unheard of. The fight to contain Auburn continued, with both David and Andrew seriously injured. It was becoming impossible for them to control Auburn. They needed help from Jim. Jim tried to engage the autopilot, but the plane had become so unstable at this point that it would not work. He had no choice but to leave the cockpit and help try to subdue Auburn. No one was in control of the plane. As the air controller tried and failed to make contact with the plane, the ground staff feared the worst. Believing that Auburn had gained control of the plane, they stood helpless, anticipating the flight crash. Meanwhile, the fight continued on board. All three men had significant injuries, but somehow found the strength to try to pin Auburn down, which allowed David to return to the cockpit and prepare to land the plane. The plane was over the maximum landing weight. He needed to dump some of the fuel. The jettison instruments to do this were on the other side of the cockpit and with his extensive injuries and the fact that Auburn could possibly break free at any moment, he decided to go ahead and attempt to land the aircraft as it was. As the plane approached the runway, it was too high, too heavy and travelling too fast to safely land. In order to divert to a longer runway that was perpendicular to his approach, the aircraft had to be turned dangerously quickly. David then simultaneously extended the landing gear, speed brakes and flaps in an attempt to reduce the speed of the aircraft as quickly as possible. Against all of the odds, David executed a successful emergency landing, bringing the plane to a safe and secure stop just metres from the end of the runway at Memphis International Airport. SWAT and emergency services rushed to the plane. The scene that greeted them was shocking. There was blood everywhere. Andrew and Jim were fighting to contain Auburn whilst David was sat in the cockpit in a state of shock. Auburn was immediately arrested and David, Jim and Andrew were transferred to the Memphis Regional Medical Center. Andrew had skull fractures and a severed temporal artery. He had lost so much blood he was barely alive. David suffered from deep head gashes, a dislocated jaw, damage to his right arm and had to have his right ear sewn back into place. Jim had skull fractures and was partially blinded in one eye. Ongoing motor control problems with his right arm and leg required multiple surgeries and years of physical and cognitive rehabilitation. However, his recovery has been more successful than anyone could ever have predicted at the time of the attack. Subsequently, the Airline Pilots Association awarded David, Jim and Andrew a gold medal for heroism, the highest honour a pilot can receive. Due to their injuries, none of the crew have ever been able to fly commercially again. Auburn pleaded temporary insanity to the charges that were brought against him, but was unsuccessful, and on 11th of August 1995, he was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. There was nearly a million dollars worth of damage to the DC-10 aircraft, however this was repaired and the plane has continued in service for FedEx. In January 2017, Auburn wrote to Barack Obama to request a pardon, mainly on the basis that he should have been found guilty by reason of insanity and received proper medical treatment. He claimed that he had been the one who received the greatest injuries that day. The reply has never been published. He remains in federal prison to this day. That concludes the story of FedEx Flight 705 from Memphis International Airport to San Jose International Airport in California. For those of you more interested in plane details, it was a McDonnell Douglas DC 10 30F. The aircraft name was John Peter Jr. Registration November 306, Foxtrot Echo. 
As usual, any comments down below will be gratefully received and appreciated. Thank you once again for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. An apology to Laurie Ellis that I didn't get to use the word garage today. She likes that word. If you've got any aviation stories, please share them. Thanks, guys. Goodbye. For today's true crime narration, we shall be visiting Antarctica, Earth's southernmost continent. Around 98% of Antarctica is covered in ice, with a population which fluctuates between around 1,000 to 4,500 people, depending upon the season. This population is made up of scientists, research and support staff from across the globe. With such a small population, crime is incredibly rare, but isolation, boredom and alcoholism may have been known to play a part. The 1959 Antarctic Treaty means that any person accused of committing a crime on the continent would be subject to the laws of their home country. Our true crime story today looks at the life of Rodney Marks. Rodney David Marks was one of three children born to Paul and Ray Marks. He was born on the 13th of March 1968 in Geelong in Victoria, Australia. Rodney was an incredibly intelligent child who was hard-working and creative. He particularly loved surfing and music. When he was a teenager, he won a scholarship to a renowned private school where he continued to excel academically. He went on to study astronomy at the University of Melbourne, graduating with first-class honours. Then, in 1993, he went to the University of New South Wales, where he completed a doctorate in physics. For Rodney's thesis, he wrote at length about the South Pole, an area which he was particularly interested in. In 1997, Rodney was accepted for a position caring for an infrared telescope called Spirex at the South Pole. Due to the extremely bleak conditions and the level of isolation involved with this work, everyone selected had to go through extensive physical and psychological tests to ensure that they would be able to withstand the harsh, isolated winter. Once at the pole for the southern winter, around March to October each year, it is not possible to leave until the worst of the weather conditions subside. After completing the winter at the South Pole, Rodney was keen to return and was successful at securing a second position, this time working at the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station. This station is run by the National Science Foundation, a United States government agency. Rodney was scheduled to complete a year at the station from November 1999 to November 2000. He was an excellent scientist holding a crucial position at the station. He was reportedly a well-liked, friendly man who enjoyed hanging out with his colleagues. Rodney played guitar in a heavy metal band that performed at the South Pole during the celebration of the new millennium and over that winter period had dyed his hair purple. He enjoyed a drink and would drink to excess on occasion, something that was not uncommon with the employees at the station. He reportedly had a high tolerance and enjoyment of alcohol, but was not dependent on it. Through their mutual love of music, he became close with a woman by the name of Sonia Walter, who was a maintenance specialist at the station. They soon became romantically involved, and Sonia elected to stay for the winter season in order to continue their relationship. They seemed very happy together, and it was rumoured that they planned to marry when they returned home. As the winter began, in early 2000, many of the staff went home, leaving a skeleton staff of 50 people to continue their work through the winter months. On 11th of May 2000, Rodney was walking between the research building and the main station when he started to feel unwell. He met Sonia for dinner, but complained that he felt very ill and his eyes were becoming itchy and irritated. Rodney decided to get some rest in the hope that he would feel better the following day. However, his symptoms continued to increase. He was feeling feverish, sick and had stomach pains. After a restless night, he visited the station doctor early the next morning. 
The doctor believed that the symptoms were related to Rodney's alcohol consumption and was not unduly concerned. Rodney returned to rest in his room, but started to become increasingly breathless, so once again visited the doctor, Dr. Robert Thompson. He decided to take a blood sample. The doctor noticed that there were already two fresh needle marks in Rodney's arm, but did not investigate this any further. The machine that may have been able to analyse Rodney's blood to see what was going on had not been correctly maintained, and as such was not working. The doctor remained none the wiser as to what was happening. Rodney became increasingly agitated and was struggling to breathe. The doctor consulted medical experts via a satellite call, but they still couldn't figure out what was going on. Then Rodney's breathing started to become slightly easier and he tried to sit himself up. As he did so, he stopped breathing and despite extensive CPR attempts, he could not be resuscitated. He died at approximately 6.45pm that day. He was just 32 years old. It was assumed that he had died from unknown natural causes. With no way in or out for the remainder of the winter, Rodney's body had to be stored at the research station. His loss was devastating to the 49 other members of staff who worked alongside him. Many of his friends were unhappy with this temporary resting place inside the station, so they worked hard to construct a casket so that he could be temporarily laid to rest under the stars that he had gone to Antarctica to study. Memorial services were held at the South Pole Station in Torquay, Australia and in Boston. It wasn't until almost six months later that Rodney's body could be moved. He was flown to Christchurch in New Zealand on 30th of October 2000 and an autopsy was performed. This revealed that there were no drugs in his system at the time of death, only a trace amount of alcohol, but a huge amount of methanol. The results shocked everyone. Rodney had been poisoned. Methanol is a highly toxic chemical. It is colourless with a slightly sweet taste. It was determined that Rodney had ingested approximately 150 millilitres, roughly equivalent to a small glass of wine. As Rodney was an Australian citizen working at the US station, which was built on land claimed by New Zealand, both the US and Australia agreed to the inquest being held in New Zealand. The autopsy raised many questions. How did Rodney ingest that amount of methanol? Was it intentionally or accidentally ingested? Why were there needle marks in his arm? The theory that Rodney had killed himself was looked into, no one who knew him had sensed that he was depressed. By all accounts, he was happy, successful, had no financial concerns, was in love and looking forward to a future with Sonia. Additionally, he sought medical help as soon as his illness started and it was not thought that the panic he showed as his illness set in could have been faked. Rodney was an extremely intelligent man who would have known that drinking methanol in order to take his own life would have led to an incredibly painful lengthy death. Suicide was therefore ruled out as a cause of death. The theory of him accidentally ingesting methanol when making his own alcohol was then pursued. This would again seem extremely unlikely due to his level of experience as a scientist and that the methanol at the station was clearly labelled and kept in a locked cupboard. There was also a ready supply of alcohol available at the station, so there was no need for Rodney to secretly make his own. Rodney had been in extreme agony, but able to communicate for approximately 38 hours before his death. If he had known what was causing his symptoms, he would have been able to tell those helping him about it. Another possibility was that Rodney had been the victim of a prank which had gone wrong. Again, this theory was discounted because of the level of methanol consumed, making it extremely unlikely that this would have been used in a prank. It seemed that the most likely explanation was that Rodney had been murdered. With only 49 other people living at the station during those winter months, and no one else able to arrive at or leave the station, the list of potential suspects was already quite low. However, the investigation of a now six-month-old murder case was problematic from the beginning. The official investigation was headed by Detective Senior Sergeant Grant Wormald at the New Zealand Police Department. 
the detective had to liaise with the National Science Foundation directly for the details of the 49 people who were present at the base at the time of Rodney's death. However, the Science Foundation were less than helpful. They had conducted their own internal investigation and concluded that Rodney had died from natural causes. It wasn't until 2006, six years after Rodney's death, that the National Science Foundation agreed to a questionnaire being sent to the 49 other employees. However, this was only sent on the basis that they approved all of the questions and participants informed that it was completely voluntary whether or not they completed it. Only 13 people responded. Many people critical to the inquiry did not complete the questionnaire. Why they chose not to respond is unknown. Were people scared of losing their jobs? Rumours have been circulating about marijuana being grown in the air ducts at the plant and the use of hard drugs within the station. We do not know whether these rumours are true, but perhaps this level of drug and alcohol abuse at a prestigious US facility was the reason for the covering up the circumstances of Rodney's death. Questions were raised over the doctor's procedures when treating Rodney. His location has been unknown since 2006. The investigation stalled. There has been no known progress in the murder investigation since. The New Zealand investigation has never been closed. However, the likelihood of finding any new information nearly 20 years later in one of the remotest places on earth seems extremely unlikely. Those who know the case have come to their own conclusions. A tragic accident? A prank gone wrong? Suicide or murder? Rodney is the only person to die under mysterious circumstances on the continent of Antarctica and quite possibly their first and only murder. That concludes the story of Rodney Marks. Thanks very much for listening to that story. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. If there's any way you can share these videos, I'd be really grateful. Thanks to all you pisters out there. Goodbye. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the first part of the story of the Stainer family and how their lives became defined by crime. Delbert Foy Stainer, known as Del, was born on the 14th of May 1933 in Farmington, New Mexico. He was one of five children born to Jesse and Luella Stainer, along with Jesse Jr., Anna May, Sharon and Maxine. Del served in the US Army as a Staff Sergeant from 1953 to 1957. Upon his return from the Army, he met a lady by the name of Kay Augustine. Kay was born in Weaverville, California and was eight years younger than Del. In 1960, Del and Kay married. Del worked as a mechanic and Kay helped to make ends meet by taking service jobs wherever she could find them. The couple went on to have five children, two boys, Carrie and Stephen, as well as three daughters, Cindy, Jody and Corey. Kerry was the oldest child. He was very protective of all of his siblings and was particularly close to his younger brother, Stephen. The family lived in Merced, California, sometimes known as the gateway to Yosemite. Merced is a city approximately 130 miles from San Francisco, which had a rapidly growing population during the 1970s. Monday, December the 4th, 1972, started out like any other day in the Stainer household. With five young children, mornings were generally busy and chaotic. The children attended local schools with seven-year-old Stephen enrolled at the Charles Wright Elementary School, which was located about half a mile from the family home in Bett Street. As was typical of the time, the children would often walk themselves to and from school. On that particular Monday afternoon, Stephen was walking home by himself after finishing school for the day. When he was just a few blocks from his house, he was approached by a seemingly friendly man by the name of Irvin Edward Murphy. Irvin asked Stephen if his mother would be interested in donating some items to the church fundraiser and Stephen replied that he believed she would. The man offered Stephen a ride home. Stephen declined, saying that he was only a couple of blocks from his house. However, the man was persistent, saying that it would be easier for them to travel together to collect the donations, and so Stephen agreed and climbed into the back of the old white Buick. Driving the car was 41-year-old Kenneth Parnell. Kenneth was born on 26th of September 1931 in Amarillo, Texas. 
After his father abandoned the family, his mother moved to California and opened a boarding house. At 14 years old, Kenneth was abused by one of the tenants. Following this, Kenneth descended into a life of crime, including arson, car theft, and public indecency. In 1951, a criminal complaint was filed against Kenneth for abusing an eight-year-old boy. He was found guilty and sent to a hospital for psychiatric assessment. Here, he was diagnosed as being a sexual psychopath. It was recommended that he be held indefinitely, but he escaped shortly afterwards. Five months later, he was recaptured and given a sentence of five years in prison. However, after just three years, in 1955, he was paroled on the condition that he seek counselling. After another short prison spell for parole violation, he moved to Utah in 1960 and was soon convicted of robbery and larceny and again imprisoned. He was released in 1967 on the condition that he left the state of Utah forever. Kenneth later moved to California and started work at the Yosemite Lodge where he met Irvin. Kenneth, who often referred to himself as Reverend, had managed to convince Irvin that he was a religious leader and that he was acting upon God's wishes in order to take a young boy and give them a better life. Irvin, who suffered from learning difficulties, was easily convinced by the manipulative Kenneth as they drove away that day, Stephen realised that they had passed the road where he lived. When he told the two men, they replied that they would call his parents to ask if he could stay the night with them. Although curious, Stephen was not particularly afraid at this point. Through talking to Stephen, Kenneth gleaned information as to the family's money worries and also that Stephen had been in trouble with his parents recently. He would use this information to manipulate the young boy. They arrived at a cabin in Cathy's Valley, which was around 20 miles from Merced. The men had already purchased lots of toys in preparation for their abduction of a child. While Stephen was initially distracted by the toys, he started to become increasingly anxious, asking to go home to his parents. Again, he was reassured by his captors that his parents had given permission for him to stay. Kenneth, using the information that he had gained from Stephen, told him that he needed to stay away from his family for a while as he had been so badly behaved. On that first night, the abuse began. On the third day, Kenneth went out, leaving Irvin to take care of Stephen. When Kenneth returned, he told Stephen that he had been to court and had now legally adopted him. Kenneth said that Stephen's parents no longer wanted him, nor could afford to keep him. Stephen was shocked and begged to go home. However, Kenneth simply told Stephen that he was his dad now and that Stephen's new name would be Dennis. Kenneth also told Stephen to start calling him dad. Kenneth and Irvin decided to move Stephen to live in the cabin at Yosemite Lodge where they lived and worked. After a few weeks at the cabin, Kenneth realised he needed a more permanent solution if he was going to be able to keep Stephen out of sight and the boy's true identity hidden. He took Stephen to live in Santa Rosa, leaving Irvin behind. The sexual, emotional and psychological abuse continued. Kenneth enrolled Stephen in a local school under the name of Dennis Parnell and warned Stephen that he must never tell anyone his true identity. When Stephen asked about his family, Kenneth told him that his dad was dead and the remaining family members had moved away from the area. Under Kenneth's constant manipulation, Stephen believed that he had nowhere else to go and no one else wanted him. Kenneth and Stephen remained living in Santa Rosa for around three years before moving to various other remote trailer parks, cabins and motels throughout Northern California. Against all of the odds, Stephen did well in school, was popular and had many friends. At some point after Kenneth abducted Stephen, Kenneth became involved with a woman by the name of Barbara Mathias. Barbara lived with Kenneth and Stephen for around 18 months. It is reported that not only was Barbara aware of Kenneth's abuse of Stephen, she actively participated in it during the time of her relationship with Kenneth. Meanwhile, the Stainer family were desperately trying to find Stephen. Dell, Stephen's father, became obsessed with tracking down every lead and was known to suddenly pack up his family in the car and drive across California to follow up on a sighting. None of these sightings ever actually led him any closer to Stephen. As time went on, the once pragmatic Dell withdrew from his family, becoming angry and dejected. Relationships became strained with his other children, particularly his eldest son, Kerry, as the search for Stephen consumed his life. 
Dell and Kay were later recorded as stating that they had neglected their other four children during this time as the emotional, physical and financial toll of searching for their missing son pushed them to breaking point. At some point, Dell lost all hope. Kay, on the other hand, did her best to keep the family together and never stopped believing that her son would someday be found. In the Stainer house, feelings and emotions were not generally discussed. Counselling or therapy was not pursued for any of the family members. Kay received no support from her father, who had always been openly critical about her decision to have a large family. When Stephen went missing, her father told her that they should be glad as it meant one less child to feed and clothe. Stephen's brother and sisters found the loss of their brother extremely difficult to deal with. Early on, Kerry would walk outside every time there was a clear night to wish upon a star for Stephen's return. As the children grew, they were always known as the kids whose brother had been kidnapped. Kerry would often wear a hat as he had started to compulsively pull his hair out from the stress that he was under. He threw his energy into becoming creative and would lose himself in his drawings, becoming a skilled cartoonist. However, he seemed to have increasing difficulty maintaining any personal relationships and became more and more isolated. By the end of 1979, which was seven years after Stephen's abduction, Kenneth and the now 14-year-old Stephen had moved to an isolated, run-down cabin in Manchester, California. Stephen was allowed to drink, smoke and take drugs from a very young age. With Kenneth's permission, he was allowed to leave the house, but had been so brainwashed by Kenneth, he would always decide to return. With Stephen now growing into a young man, Kenneth was starting to lose interest in him sexually and wanted a new young boy to abuse and control. Kenneth attempted to get Stephen to assist him in taking another child, but Stephen would deliberately fail to follow his instructions in order to sabotage any kidnapping attempt. Believing Stephen to be incompetent, Kenneth managed to convince one of Stephen's friends, a local boy by the name of Sean Poorman, to assist him. He bribed Sean with drugs and money, before finally threatening him in order to get him to help with a kidnapping. On 13th of February 1980, a five-year-old boy by the name of Timmy White was playing in front of his parents' house in Ukiah, California. Sean approached Timmy and tried to persuade him to get into Kenneth's car. Timmy refused and tried to run indoors, but Sean grabbed him and forced the screaming young boy into the back of the car. Kenneth immediately set to work brainwashing Timmy, telling him that he would now be his dad. Kenneth also told him that from now on he would be called Tommy, not Timmy. When they returned to the cabin, Kenneth dyed little Timmy's blonde hair dark brown. And when Stephen returned from school that day, he was told that Timmy was his new younger brother. Realising that the same fate that he had endured awaited Timmy, something in Stephen snapped and he realised that he needed to act. Stephen quickly formed a close bond with the young boy and he knew that he had to help him escape. On 1st of March 1980, while Kenneth was working the night shift at a nearby hotel, Stephen and Timmy left the cabin. They walked for miles from their remote home before a passing trucker gave them a lift to Ukiah, which was over 40 miles away. Stephen had planned to return Timmy home, but the distressed five-year-old could only remember that he lived in Ukiah, but not the specific address. Stephen decided to take Timmy to the police station. He explained to Timmy what to say and sent him inside alone. But Timmy was frightened and he ran back to Stephen. Unable to persuade Timmy to go into the police station by himself, Stephen accompanied him inside. When police saw the missing young boy who had been the subject of a lot of media attention, it was initially assumed that Stephen was the one who had taken him. However, when police interviewed Stephen, he told them that he had also been taken as a young boy. He told the police, I know my first name is Stephen, I think my last name is Stainer. When pressed further about what had happened, Stephen told the police officers about Kenneth, who was arrested and charged shortly after. Timmy's parents, Angie and James, soon arrived at the police station to collect their little boy, and Stephen's parents were contacted to say that he had been found. The police drove Stephen back to his family home in Merced. The family had never moved from the house in the hope that Stephen would one day find his way back to them. By the time the police arrived with Stephen, the house on Bet Street was surrounded by reporters. It became a huge news story that this little boy had finally returned home. Stephen was hailed a hero for his bravery in rescuing young Timmy. 
television appearances, book deals and newspaper interviews quickly followed, it would seem that no one could get enough of this so-called amazing happy ending. However, despite the blaze of positive publicity, Stephen's return home was not without difficulty. After suffering over seven years of intense physical, sexual, emotional and psychological abuse, Stephen struggled to settle into life with his family. Whilst he said that his parents really hadn't changed that much, he barely recognised his brother and sisters. Stephen was used to living with one other person where he was allowed to smoke, drink and take drugs and he was suddenly a 14 year old young man who had been dropped into a busy family with typical family rules. Kerry, who was away on a camping trip in Yosemite when he heard of Stephen's return, was initially elated that his younger brother had been found. However, the two boys, now 18 and 14, found it impossible to reform the bond that they had shared when they were younger. Stephen returned to school, but had a difficult time resuming his studies. With Kenneth's trial looming closer and intense public interest, he would often be away from class. When certain schoolmates found out about the details of Stephen's ordeal, he was bullied relentlessly about his past and his sexuality. In the summer of 1981, Kenneth went on trial for the kidnapping of Timmy White. Both Timmy and Stephen testified and after less than two hours of jury deliberations, Kenneth was found guilty of the second degree kidnapping of Timmy. He received the maximum sentence allowed by the law at the time, seven years in prison. Due to his age at the time, Sean Pullman, who had assisted Kenneth with Timmy's abduction, was sentenced to a short spell in a juvenile detention centre. Later that year, on December 1st, 1981, Kenneth and Irvin went on trial for the kidnapping of Stephen and an additional conspiracy charge. Pat Holford, the Merced County District Attorney at the time, wanted to prosecute Kenneth for all of the abuse crimes, but due to the statute of limitations in California at the time, this was not allowed. Again, both Stephen and Timmy testified at the trial. The defence argued that Stephen was away from Kenneth's control and could have left at any time, with prosecutors arguing that he was a psychological prisoner. When Stephen was asked why he hadn't tried to escape earlier, he said that he believed everything that Kenneth had told him, that his family did not want him, that his father was dead, and that Kenneth was now his adoptive father. However, once Timmy arrived, he could not bear the thought of another child suffering in the way he had. Both Kenneth and Irvin were found guilty on 24th of December 1981. Barbara Mathias, who had a relationship with Kenneth and participated in Stephen's abuse, was never charged. On 7th of January 1982, at Alameda County Superior Court, Irvin received a five-year sentence on each count. The terms would run concurrently. Kenneth received a two-year sentence for Stephen's kidnapping and a five-year sentence for conspiracy to kidnap. Again, these sentences would run concurrently with each other and his previous sentence for Timmy's kidnapping. This was the maximum punishment allowed by California law at the time. As a result of this insultingly low sentence and the public outcry which followed, changes were made to state law which allowed for full consecutive rather than concurrent terms for child kidnappings in similar cases. With the trials over, both Stephen and Timmy continued to return to a more normal life Timmy's ordeal had been short in comparison to Stephen's and he managed to reintegrate into family life well. However, Stephen continued to struggle. By the time he was 19, he had over $1,100 of outstanding parking fines and had lost his driving license. He did not manage to graduate from high school and was struggling to fit in with his family's regular lifestyle. Other than a few sessions with a counsellor, Stephen did not receive any mental health support. Eventually, the relationships within the family home broke down to such a point that Dell asked Stephen to move out. Stephen still persevered and was determined to forge a better life for himself. He started a welding course at the local college in the hope of being able to get a better job. He also began a relationship with a local girl by the name of Jodie Edmondson. In 1984, Dell and Kay Stainer were quoted as saying, that their wish for Stephen was that he would be able to find a good job and lead a happy life. In 1985, the family were dealt another blow. With time off for good behaviour, Kenneth was released from prison on the 5th of April. He had served just five years of his sentence, two years less than the length of Stephen's ordeal. Two months later, 20-year-old Stephen married 17-year-old Jodie and they also welcomed their first child Ashley in December 1985. 
Despite all of the odds, Stephen was repairing his life. The young couple welcomed a second child, Stephen Jr., in May 1987. Stephen had started to attend church and was volunteering to help others who had gone through a similar ordeal to him. He also spent time educating young children to protect them from enduring a similar fate. Whilst obviously still battling many demons, Jodie was confident that Stephen was recovering and healing. He was obviously still in a great deal of pain, but he was getting through it. He was a survivor. On 5th of April 1988, Kenneth completed his probation period. At that point, he was free to travel wherever he wanted and associate with whoever he chose, including children. At around the same time, a mini-series called I Know My First Name Is Stephen was being made with Stephen's full cooperation. The production weighed heavily on Stephen and he was relieved once it had been completed. Despite the toll it took on him personally, Stephen was determined to be involved with anything that would make his story known and could raise awareness for other children. Stephen was also working at a local pizza restaurant. On 16th of September 1989, following his shift at the restaurant, Stephen was riding home on his motorcycle, which he had purchased using some of the money that he earned from the television series. A vineyard worker in a truck pulled out in front of Stephen's motorcycle, knocking Stephen off of his bike. Stephen was not wearing a helmet and sustained massive head injuries. He was rushed to Merced Community Medical Center, but he was declared dead on arrival. He was just 24 years old. His wife Jodie became a widow and single mother to their three-year-old daughter and two-year-old son at just 20 years of age. Stephen's parents, Kay and Del, were on a camping trip at the time of the accident. Friends had to track them down to let them know the devastating news. The driver of the truck, Antonio Lura, did not stop at the scene of the accident. Antonio surrendered himself to police in Tijuana four days later. He was charged with felony hit and run and manslaughter. He was found guilty and sentenced to just three months in jail and a hundred dollar fine. 14 year old Timmy White was a pallbearer at Stephen's funeral. After Stephen's death, Del and Kay sold the family home, stating that they wanted to get away from the area in order to try to wash away some of the bad memories. In 2003, 15 years after the end of his probation period, Kenneth was arrested at his home in San Francisco after a police investigation uncovered his plan to buy a child. During a police sting operation, he was found to be trying to purchase a four-year-old boy online for $500. I've been unable to find any additional information about the 15 year period between the end of Kenneth's probation and this arrest, but it would seem incredibly unlikely that he became a law abiding citizen during this period. At Kenneth's new trial, Timmy was again called to testify, along with Sean Pullman, the teenager who had been coerced into helping Kenneth abduct Timmy. It was the first time that Timmy and Sean had seen each other since Timmy's abduction 24 years earlier. After speaking briefly, the two hugged, Timmy having forgiven Sean for his part in the abduction. On 25th of April 2004, Kenneth was again found guilty and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. He died in Vacaville Prison on 21st of January 2008 at the age of 76. The year after the trial, at the age of 30, Timmy White became a Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department deputy and like Stephen before him, gave talks to children in the hope that he could avoid them ever having to experience what both Stephen and him endured. Just five years later, on April the 1st, 2010, Timmy died of a pulmonary embolism. He was just 35 years old. He was survived by his wife, Dina, two children, his parents and his sister. 28th of August 2010, a statue of Stephen and Timmy was unveiled at the entrance to Applegate Park in Merced. Local residents had worked for seven years to create a monument recognising Stephen's bravery and dedicated to all missing children. Goodbye. For this week's true crime story, we shall be looking at the troubled life of Robert Maudsley, who, since the death of the Moors murderer Ian Brady in 2017, has become the UK's longest serving prisoner. Robert John Maudsley was born on the 26th of June 1953 in Toxheath, Liverpool. His mother, Jean, and father, Robert, already had three young children at the time of Robert's birth, three-year-old Brenda, two-year-old Paul, and one-year-old Kevin. 
Robert's father was a lorry driver who did little to help his wife Jean cope with the demands of four young children. Before Robert was two years old, all four of the Maudsley children had been taken into care after they had been identified as suffering from parental neglect. The children were sent to Nazareth House in Crosby, a coastal town near Liverpool. The orphanage was run by nuns who took care of the Maudsley children. The children attended a local school and formed a close bond with each other and looked upon the nuns as their parents. They were safe, well cared for and happy. However, this happiness was to be short-lived. Robert Senior and Jean went on to have eight more children and only visited Robert, Kevin, Paul and Brenda very occasionally. The four siblings had a strong family bond but felt that their parents were little more than strangers. When Robert was around nine years old, their parents decided to take him and his three older siblings back to the family home. The children were taken away from the only childhood they had ever really known and the safety and security of Nazareth House, only to be placed into a completely unfamiliar home environment. Their father was an abusive and violent man. Their mother, whilst not directly violent towards the children, often instigated conflicts which would lead to violence. All three of the boys sustained physical abuse. Brenda, however, was never beaten. Robert suffered horrific physical abuse and at one point was locked in a room for six months with his father arriving several times a day to beat him. Within a year, Robert had been removed from the home and placed in foster care. The other children were left living with their parents. It is not known why only Robert was put into foster care. He was now alone with no contact with his three older siblings with whom he had grown up. His siblings were told that Robert had died. Robert spent the next few years moving between foster homes and by the time he was 16 he moved to London and found work as a labourer. It wasn't long before he began experimenting with drugs and within six months his drug addiction had taken over his life. He started working as a rent boy to support this drug habit. In March 1974, whilst working as a rent boy, Robert was picked up by a 30-year-old labourer by the name of John Farrell. John was a paedophile and showed Robert pictures of children who he had abused. Something inside of Robert snapped. He attacked John and garroted him. Robert was arrested soon after. He was held on remand before being deemed unfit to stand trial. Robert was sent to the High Security Psychiatric Hospital, Broadmoor, in Berkshire, where he was due to spend the rest of his life. Three years later, in 1977, 24-year-old Robert, along with a fellow prisoner, David Cheeseman, took another prisoner, David Francis, hostage and barricaded themselves into a prison cell. David Francis was a 26-year-old convicted paedophile. The two men proceeded to torture David Francis for nine hours. Finally, they garroted him before holding his body up so that the guards could view it through the spy hatch on the door. It was widely reported at the time that the victim's skull had been cracked open like a boiled egg and part of his brain had been eaten by his attackers with a spoon. This led to Robert being known as the Brain Eater and later Hannibal the Cannibal. However, in later reports it came to light that the victim's autopsy showed that his brain was intact at the time of his death there was no evidence of cannibalism. In fact, the victim had been stabbed through the ear with a weapon made from a spoon. It was not used to eat his brain. Despite Robert previously being deemed mentally unfit for trial, hence the reason he was in Broadmoor in the first place, he was on this occasion deemed fit to stand trial. He was convicted of manslaughter and sent to Wakefield Prison in Yorkshire. It is reported that Robert hated it in Wakefield Prison and was desperate to return to Broadmoor. However, this did not happen. Just a few months into his sentence at Wakefield, on 28th of July 1978, Robert was waiting for his French lesson from convicted wife killer, 46-year-old Saulney Darwood. When Saulney entered Robert's cell, Robert attacked him. Saulney was stabbed repeatedly before being garroted. Robert then hid Saulney's body under his bed and attempted to lure other prisoners into his cell. He was unsuccessful. Robert then left his cell and went on the hunt for another victim. Robert found William Roberts, a 56-year-old serving time for the sexual assault of a 7-year-old girl. Robert stabbed William multiple times with a makeshift dagger before smashing his head against the wall. 
Once he had finished, Robert calmly walked into the prison officer's room, placed the makeshift dagger onto the table and informed the prison officer that the next roll call would be two inmates short. Robert was convicted of both of these murders and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. He was returned to Wakefield Prison where he was not allowed to mix with other prisoners for both his and their safety. Classified as Britain's most dangerous prisoner, he was placed into solitary confinement. His lawyers at the time argued that the killings had taken place as a result of pent-up anger from his childhood that had been filled with near-constant abuse. At the time, Robert was quoted as saying, When I kill, I think I have my parents in mind. If I had killed my parents in 1970, none of these people need have died. If I had killed them, then I would be walking around as a free man without a care in the world. During his sentence, he was moved to other high security prisons, including spending some time at Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight. During this period, he was treated by a psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Bob Johnson, who believed that he was starting to make progress with Robert, which would someday allow him to reintegrate with the prison population. However, after three years, and to Dr. Johnson's dismay, these sessions were stopped. After five years in solitary confinement, Robert was still classified as one of Britain's most dangerous prisoners. In 1983, a special two-cell unit was built for him in the basement of Wakefield Prison. The space, measuring approximately 5.5 metres by 4.5 metres, has bulletproof windows and a team of prison officers who are dedicated to supervising Robert. The only furniture in the cell is a table and chair, both of which have been made from compressed cardboard, a bed which is a concrete slab with a mattress, and a toilet and sink which are both bolted to the floor. A solid steel door opens into a small cage which is encased in thick perspex. A small slot at the bottom allows guards to pass food and other items to Robert. For a visitor to reach this unit, they have to pass through 17 locked solid steel doors. The cell has been likened to that used to house Hannibal Lecter in the film The Silence of the Lambs which was released in 1991. Every day Robert spends 23 out of 24 hours in this cell. During the other hour he is escorted for his daily exercise by six prison guards. It is understood that Robert has a genius level IQ and loves literature, classical music and poetry. He has written many letters from his prison cell where he's described his life as like being buried alive in a concrete coffin. In March 2000, having spent 17 years in this glass cage and a total of 22 years in solitary confinement, Robert requested that the conditions of his solitary confinement were relaxed, specifically to allow him to own a pet budgerigar, have access to classical music and a television, or if that was not allowed, that he should be given access to a cyanide capsule to enable him to commit suicide. All of these requests were denied. Robert reportedly has no interest in being released from prison, but simply wants to be treated on an equal footing to any other prisoner. Both the physical and mental effects of his incarceration are rumoured to have left Robert looking much older than his years, although there are no recent photographs to confirm this. It is understood that through lack of contact he is now unable to speak clearly. Whilst Robert's crimes were undoubtedly horrific, many have questioned whether his sentence and confinement are appropriate when compared to other murderers and serial killers. He remains in solitary confinement to this day, nearly 42 years since the double murder in Wakefield Prison. That's the story of Robert Maudsley. Please leave any comments down below, I'll be interested in reading them. I'd just like to raise a glass to all the essential workers around the world for everything you're doing to help. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks once again for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. I mentioned Wakefield Prison and that's in Yorkshire. I just wanted to say hello to anyone from Yorkshire, including Pickety Witch and also Janet Carr Walton. Hey up. How do? Hope you're all well. If you fancied putting in any Yorkshire phrases in your comments, then please feel free to do so. Thank you once again for listening to The Crime Reel. See thee.